Good afternoon. Welcome uh, Lincoln Hills residents and guests. My name is Kyle Bodyfelt, Sun City Lincoln Hills Executive Director. On behalf of the association, we are happy to be hosting this important missile site forum. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the MC today, Ray Burge. You weren't kidding when you said that was going to be short. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, uh, to the, I have to read it because it's long, to the Titan Missile One. Welcome to the Titan Missile One ex ex Environmental Remediation Committee Palliant Forum. Now you don't want to have to read it. Anyway, I'd like to welcome everybody. Obviously, um, it's, a, it's a, the reins of hell lost for us, at least. Uh, Ann and I live in the Sun City, and like a lot of you, uh, we have a lot of concern about what happens in our community, and specifically, of course, in Sun City. From the size of this group, it's apparent a lot of you have been following uh, what's been going on with this lingering contamination issue that was raised by Ann. Um, back in back in September, uh, and then followed up with a series of very in-depth articles um, by Carol Feynman regarding this. I don't I don't know what title to give it, but I'm just going to call it this, this issue. Okay. A um, couple of things I want to make clear: this is not a political issue. And this is not about limiting responsible growth or development. Uh, if anything, it's just the opposite. Uh, it's, a, it's about education, and it's about building trust so that we, in fact, we can grow more responsibly. Building trust and maintaining trust requires one simple ingredient, and that's transparency. And transparency is not always easy to accomplish. Even good people can make poor decisions when nobody's paying attention. You can, there's no adage that says you can expect only that which you inspect. And when people are paying attention and looking over your shoulder, uh, you tend to do it right. Now is our time to ask Congress and our responsible leaders and spend time looking over their shoulder to do what needs to be done to get this whole contamination thing taken care of after all these years. The, um, I know a lot of you have questions. A lot of you have already asked me a lot of questions. Most of the questions center around a couple of issues. One is, what's a danger to me right now and my property? And the other one is, is what the heck's going to be done about it and when? And what can we do? So we're here today, hopefully, to shed some light on these concerns and answer a lot of your questions. Here to help us today are several serious-minded and experienced panel members and informed VIP attendees who are here, some of those which will be on Zoom. Um, we have a large group, and so we're anticipating a lot of uh, questions. We know that we'll get questions from the audience and from Zoom, which will be duplications. So in the interest of getting this done as well as we can in a short time as we can, we'd like to have you hold your questions until the end of the panel presentations. And then we'll open the floor, uh, both here and on Zoom, in terms of questions uh, to be addressed to any of the panel or whomever you feel you need to ask. What I'd like to do is just move right into this process. I'd like to introduce our panel one at a time. Uh, the first gentleman, a lot of you know, Bill Larson is our Lincoln, is a Lincoln City Council member in District 4, also uh -huh. resident of Sun City. I'm going to ask Bill, since he's more familiar with a lot of faces than I am, I'm going to ask Bill to introduce uh, a lot of our VIPs. Now, there's a lot of people here that I'd consider VIPs, and it's I'm sure there's people come in at the last minute, so we may miss a few people, and if we do, I apologize ahead of time, but we want you to let you know who's here as much as we can. So, Bill, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ray. My name is William Larson. I am the uh, City Council member, representative for District 4, which does include this... I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Larson. I am the... 
I am the city council member for District 4, which includes the, uh, uh, the site, the missile site, plus Sun City. Uh, I'm also a resident of Sun City. I live here, and that's one of the reasons I, you know, I'm very interested in this. Uh, I mean, we're here today to discuss the Titan I missile site, which was abandoned in the 1960s. It's what they call a FUDS, which is an acronym for Formerly Used Defense Site. Most of it is underground, it's flooded, and we're somewhat concerned by the contamination of the site and the surrounding area. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, dignitaries that are here today. Uh, I believe we have, uh, let's see, I think on Zoom we have Dominic Ferreira from, uh, from Senator uh, Feinstein's office. Uh, we have Edward Heideck from uh, uh, Kevin Kiley, our U.S. Congressman, Tiffany Sathoff, who is the Chief of Staff for Joe Patterson from the California State Assembly, uh, Christina Ferreira, and uh, Shante Landon. Uh, I believe they said they would be here, but they might be on Zoom. Uh, we also have Orlinda Bauman from uh, Senator uh, Nilos, our state senator. Uh, my fellow council members, uh, Paul Joyner, who is the mayor, and Holly Andriata. Uh, uh, who else do we have here? Uh, well, if I missed anybody, I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute, hold it. Yes, any of the Sun City Board of Directors here? Uh, if they are, could they just wave? Yeah, okay, I see them already. Anyway, uh, I'd like to turn this over to um, Ann, who is going to give you a, a much more detailed uh, analysis of, of what we're doing, okay? You also have uh, Roberto Ruiz from Office of U.S. Senator Alex Padilla. Just wanted to introduce myself. Thank you. Did you guys like my voice that deep? <laughs> I think it's in the back. Oh, okay. I threw my voice pretty good on that one. My name is Anne Constantine Burge, and between Carol Feynman and I, the editor of the Lincoln News Messenger, we started this thing going on and I thank every one of you who are in the audience today for being here. Those who are on Zoom, our representatives in our local county and state government for being here. I started this on my husband's birthday in August of last year, worked at night and day to try to figure out what was going on and what we needed to do and so far you all have stepped up to the plate. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Cold War, mutually assured destruction, we will bury you. Phrases we heard during NBC Huntley Brinkley News Hour. In the 1950s, I was attending school in Norman, Oklahoma, where we had tornado drills routinely, and we had to go into a dank, dark tunnel under the street until the simulated tornado went by. For uh, nuclear bomb drills, and I want you guys to raise your hands if you remember this, the teachers made us get under our desks <laughs> and we all learned to count by counting wads of gum. <laughs> Though Oklahoma had lots of tornadoes, they didn't have any nuclear missiles that I'm aware of, and, but Lincoln did. Lincoln was uh, lucky enough to get three uh, of the Titan I Miss missiles that could move an armed nuclear warhead at about 17,000 miles per hour toward its target, which at the time was somewhere in Russia, about 6,300 miles away. It was built under uh, the, the sites, 54 of them across America in California, Colorado, Idaho, South Dakota, and Washington. Each had three missiles at each site they were identical unless there was some geography issue or other things, but they were identical. And um, they each had three missiles. They were all affiliated with an Air Force base. We were affiliated with Beale Air Force Base. Uh, by December 1960, the first Titan site was completed in South Dakota. By February 1961, Beale's Air Force Beale Air Force Base's $40 million Titan sites were located at Chico, the Live Oak, which is just north of the Sutter Buttes, 
and Lincoln. And Lincoln, by December, uh, I'm sorry, by February 1961, had her three birds safely tucked in their underground nests. Uh, when they were building the site here, they moved more than 600,000 cubic yards of dirt and rock. They used 32,000 cubic yards of concrete, 300 tons of pipe, 90 miles of cable, and 1,800 nails and screws. <laughs> but um, next slide, please. This is an aerial view of the Titan site looking south after the, the uh, site was built. You really can't see anything there because it's totally underground. The site is 900 by 1600 feet wide and uh, about, covers about 34 acres underground. Next slide, please. These are the diesel generators that ran this, the facility. To run the facility on a day-to-day -day basis, they only used two of the 1,020-watt kilowatt-hour um, generators. And if you can see how small that staff member is compared to the generators, when they were raising the rockets, they used all four of them, all four of the generators. The people who um, ran the site, they were assigned out of Beale Air Force Base, but they were called missileers, which I just learned about. I thought that was kind of cool to have a special name for the guys that handled the missiles. Next site, please. Monthly, for, every, uh, for four years, while the, the uh, missiles were used at these 54 sites, uh, they had to have one rocket go into a launch exercise. And they would raise it, fuel it, and then they'd play around with the clock and you know then they'd have to unload everything and uh, unload all the fuels which was a lot of fuel when the rocket or when the missile was completely loaded with with RP1 which is rocket propellant 1 a highly modified kerosene and liquid oxygen it weighed 220,000 pounds and could go 17,000 miles an hour but once completed, all the fuels were returned to their storage tanks. Then large amounts of a degreaser that y'all have heard about called trichloroethylene, or TCE, was used to clean the pipes, the tanks, down to the micron level. They couldn't reuse the TCE, so it went into some seal chambers along with extra RP1, and that was ejected onto the ground. Next slide, please. Unable to reuse the TCE and there being no environmental protection agency in the 1960s, they had to use the seal chambers to eject this, these chemicals, which then soaked into the groundwater. Sadly, before the birds were even three years old, they were deemed obsolete and they were doomed. Lincoln's site closed in March 1965 and the last site closed June 1965. Four years for three sites in California that cost more than $40 million. Thankfully though, America never launched any of their birds in anger. When they were doing testing of the Titan I missiles at Vandenberg and Cape Canaveral, they tested about 70 of them in test flights. Well, 24% of them failed disastrously either in the launch silo as they were coming out or up in the air exploding. Go online and check out launch of Titan I missiles. You'll be amazed and laugh at some of this stuff. But um, uh, little remains of the site right now, uh, except for the doors. And the, the silos sit maybe about four feet, maybe four and a half feet above the ground. The silo doors, there are two of them that open in the middle. They, um, they each door weighs 125 pounds. Tons. They're 19 feet long, 12 feet wide, and 4 feet thick, and each one of them opened up and allowed the missiles to come up. Now, when the Department of Defense decided that they were going to be shutting down all the sites, 
for Lincoln to have all of the uh, materials on the inside scrapped, recycled. They had to pay a recycler over $100,000 to come take everything out of the site. So all that was left is a now 34-acre water-filled grave. Next slide, please. These are the properties that are adjacent to the um, Titan Missile site. And if you go outside later, you'll see these same slides on the windows. You can see them a little bit better there. The main site in the middle is the Titan site. Off to the left is the Catholic Church. And down below is Crocker Knoll and then Century Communities or Hidden Hills. Um, on the left side, or I'm sorry, on the right side is the Skellinger Trustees property that used to be called the Spinoza property. Don't forget that. Um, next slide, please. This is a bulldozer at the 84-foot level in a silo that is destined to be 165 feet deep. The silo is 40 feet across. And this is, uh, to me, it's just an amazing picture. The, the site is amazing. I don't know where some of these pictures were taken. Um, next picture, please. This is the control center and powerhouse. The powerhouse is where you saw the diesel generators. It is approximately 130 feet across and 50 or 60 feet tall, but they're buried underground by at least 40 feet. They could not have, the site could not have withstood a direct hit from a nuclear bomb. It could have taken a near hit, um, but um, the tunnels, there's more than 2,000 feet of tunnels in some places, there's up to 3,000 feet in some of the sites, and those tunnels are nine and a half feet across. They also had about 17 structures. It was a city staffed by a huge crew of people. Uh, next, next slide, please. This is one of the tunnel junctions. That opening is nine and a half feet across. Next sli slide, please. Um, this is a plume map. And you can see where Highway 193 is. That's up towards the north. Uh, you can see where the two developments are. Um, and uh, the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers, whom I'll call the Corps, has been working since uh, at least 2002, putting well, monitoring wells in for groundwater and soil vapor to determine the amount of TCE and other chemicals that are in the in the groundwater and in the soil. Uh, and uh, Lenny will be explaining about TCE in the soil and the groundwater. TCE wasn't known at the site, even though they used the site from 61 to 65. No one knew that it was contaminated with TCE until a developer wanted to build and was told there was TCE on it 32 years ago. Since then, the Corps did um, three years of test extraction um, at the site. It was a, a test extraction well, and they took out about 10 pounds of TCE just in that one well. From 2017, the Army Corps of Engineers has worked to uh, put out quarterly uh, huge documents that uh, uh, delineate all of the testing that they're doing at all of these soil vapor and groundwater uh, monitoring wells. Most of the TCE plume uh, is a 16 acre plume and most of it is under Crocker Knoll which is on the left there. Um, because the Lincoln Missileers used the seal chambers to dump the TCE onto the ground, cleanup is the responsibility of the Department of Defense. But wait, <laughs> there's more. In 1968, Placer County bought the 45-acre Lincoln Titan site from the Department of Defense for $25,000. From about 1973 to 1999, there were two gun ranges on there. One was the Placer Foothill Shooters Trap and Skeet Club, and the other was the Placer County 
sheriff's department. Uh, and they used that for their uh, training as well as tournaments for at least five years between 1973 and 1977, between four and 800 officers from all across America um, came, came to this site. Turn to the uh, next slide, please. They came to this site and shot lots of lead. The, uh, uh, this is lead atop the, the silo, one of the silo doors. I didn't know until I was cropping it that they point right at the Catholic Church. Sorry. <laughs> but um, the cleanup of the lead will be the responsibility of Placer County because Placer County owns the Titan site. Um, and since Placer County uh, recently sent us a um, remedial action plan, I couldn't think of the name of it, they, we know they are going to be working on cleaning this up. It will take some time. None of this is going to be done overnight. Uh, we expect it to be done by Christmas. Um, uh, when the Cold War's threats of doom are memories in grandparents' minds, the health and safety of current and future residents has to be in the minds of everyone else. After the contaminants are removed, homes can be built and families can be raised. Now, when I first started doing this, I have to tell you, I didn't want anything built on that site. Some of you remember me saying that. But after talking with Lenny, who's the expert on uh, contamination and remediation, um, I realized that once it's cleaned up, things can be done. So there will be, uh, that will be done to remind our older generation that these titans protected us as we slept. Now, I was going to stop here, but uh, I, I want to go on with just a few more minutes. Next slide, please. These are documents that you can find on geotracker.waterboards.ca.gov. And you can find every document that I used to give you this information. Now, I have about that many documents that the Water Board and the Corps don't know that I've been going through to be able to address all of this nitpicking stuff that, as a committee, we're doing with them to make sure that people are safe. This is what the committee is trying to do to ensure the health and safety of current and future residents. Next slide, please. In February 2023, I wrote a letter to the Central Valley Water Board asking them to ensure other Titan missile site contamination issues were remediated. They weren't really receptive to my requests, and I wasn't going to include them in these in this talk today, but I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm allowed. So the Water Board, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, our local, county, state, and federal government officials, and our audience and our Zoom audience uh, become aware of these issues at the same time. I'm going to share all of these issues that I have, these contamination issues with you. Asbestos was used at identical Titan sites, 54 other sites, each with three t silos, missile silos. It's, they, it was used because this was an extremely hazardous and flammable environment. It's a high probability we had asbestos in, our, in ours. So it would behoove the powers that be to test the facility water. It is completely flooded with water. Uh, back in November, when the water board went with me to look at the site, the water was visible about 10 or 12 feet below the surface at the air vents. And um, now, after all the rains, I'm sure it's pretty full. So um, I want them to test the water inside the silo to see if it is or isn't contaminated with asbestos. In 1979, on the, on the right side where the Skellinger Trust property is, um, Pat and Frank Spinoza, they were on the right side, or the wrong side, I guess, of the sheriff's pistol range. And they complained for years about ammunition landing on their property, structures, all the neighbors wanted it to stop. 
So um, I hope that the uh, people that are responsible for testing will test to see if there's lead. Now the other thing that the Spinozas did was they, uh, with somebody's permission, they started taking water out of the silos for their property. Asbestos contaminated, possibly asbestos contaminated water. They got caught in 79, so Placer County went into a lease agreement with the Spinozas in 1979 and 1981 so the Spinozas could take more water out of the silos. Um, then, in July 1966, after the county purchased the site, the, um, or before the county, uh, see, the county purchased the site in 1968. In 1966, there was a uh, fire station built, Fire Station 72. And um, uh, there was also a fire on the site. It was an electrical fire. Lincoln Fire, which somebody said was probably volunteers and uh, the California Department of Forestry could not put this fire out. So they called Beale. Beale came to the rescue and they used firefighting foam to put out this electrical fire. I'm sure that somebody can go through the old records and maybe find where that fire was located, but I asked the Army Corps of Engineers to test for PFOS or PFOS to see if these forever chemicals were on the site. They assured me no, no forever chemicals or these uh, firefighting foams were used on the site. They were not even made available to the military until the 70s. Well, I sent them in this letter. I said, said, well, no, I even sent them a copy of the article that in 1966, the Navy and 3M patented aqueous film forming foam that had PFOS in it. July 1966, Beale put out a fire using firefighting foam. So hopefully somebody's going to test at various locations to see if there is that forever chemical that y'all are hearing about on the news. Then, um, as you all know, gas stations and other places, even uh, farms out here that have abandoned underground storage tanks are required to remove them. Um, I requested that the water board ensure that, that they do testing of the soil and that they ensure that the uh, underground storage tanks are removed. Well, I'm not sure when the EPA became the EPA, but they told me that in the 1960s and 70s, all of the underground storage tanks were removed. Well, Chico didn't even remove their storage tanks until the 1990s. And the only tank that I can 100% say was removed was, the, uh, was one liquid oxygen tank. 50,000 pounds empty, 60 feet long, and there were three of them. This was a highly specialized tank. They had, nitri they had nitrogen dioxide, they had liquid nitrogen, helium, and liquid oxygen tanks. There's a pretty good chance they took these specialized tanks out because they were so special. Liquid oxygen burns off at 297 degrees below zero. So out here in the summer, if they were to load up one of the, the missiles, it's just burning off. It was an amazing sight, supposedly. Well, anyway, so except for those tanks, more than likely, as with the Chico site, the ground is contaminated around those underground storage tanks. The diesel tanks, there were two of them, 65,000 gallons apiece and on with the other, the, hydro, uh, the hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrazine, uh, RP1, they had, I uh, believe, a 40,000 gallon of RP1, which was highly modified kerosene, rocket propellant. Um, they had six seal chambers. They had a chemical waste clarifier where they would put certain chemicals in it, mix it with uh, inert materials, and then probably threw it in the, either the oxidation pond or the sewage ponds, these huge containments. However, before these, site, before these tanks can be removed, 
there are millions of gallons of water in that site. And if you want to go online, Google a drone video of the Lincoln site. Um, Google others. Go to chromehooves.net for the, some of the pictures of underneath. So it'll be part of the Lincoln Titan missile site contamination and remediation records. We're sending all of this to the Army Corps of Engineers, the Central Valley Water Board, the City of Lincoln, and Placer County. The Water Board and the Army Corps of Engineers are having comments periods that we expect as many of you all to submit comments regarding the site. We'll put that information, contact information, on next door, e-news. I'm sure Carol can put it in the newspaper. Um, the city can probably put it on um, the, the website under community news. All of these different contact email addresses for government officials. We need to be able to convince Congress to allocate funding so that the Army Corps of Engineers can hire people to clean this site up. Um, uh, so send your, send your letters in. <laughs> anyway, um, join, there's also another thing called the um, Restoration Advisory Board, and Lenny was part of getting that started. How many of you all received a letter from the Army Corps of Engineers about the, a lot of you. It's going to be a great committee that will be working with the Corps to get information to you all. So. Uh, we want to get this cleaned up. It's been since 1991, 32 years of knowing about the contamination, of monitoring it, is 32 years too long. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. I have been living with an encyclopedia for months now. Name. I don't know what that noise is, that thumping. It reminds me of when I was had my consulting business on the road, staying in hotel rooms. Somebody above me sounded sound like somebody's having fun, and I'm not. I'd like to introduce next uh, our primary speaker here. Probably has more answers for your questions than anybody else. Uh, Lenny Sigal has has been gracious about coming here. He is the Executive Director for the Center for Public Environmental Oversight, Contamination and Remediation Expert uh, from Mountain View. Lenny has the person that I think can answer a tremendous amount of our questions in terms of both how dangerous it is and where do we go next. Lenny? Good, good afternoon. Before I start, I would like to Again, give every, have everybody give Anne a round of applause. She's done incredible research on this site. When, when I started doing this, this stuff wasn't available on the internet. <laughs> it's, but so, so you can get a lot of good information. Um, the number one reason this site's going to get cleaned up is the fact that you folks are here in this room. That's really what it's about. The formerly used defense site program is part of the defense environmental restoration program, but it's sort of like the, the orphan child. Uh, it doesn't get as much money as the base closures or the active bases. And so the various facilities are fighting for money. The various facilities are fighting for money, uh, and it's where, where people make the noise or, or I guess the the the, uh, the squeaky degreaser with TCE uh, gets the, gets the work done. <laughs> so, all right, all right. <laughs> I'll pretend like I'm talking to my cat. Uh, so, so as Anne was going through some of the history, there was work done for a while in the early 2000s. The Army Corps extracted 10 pounds of TCE from the groundwater at the site. And that's actually a lot, given the low levels of concentration that you find. And in 2009, there was a plan to do a cleanup, but it never happened because the county and the Army Corps couldn't agree who was responsible. So the, the Regional Water Board, which is a regulatory agency, 
had approved a contamination cleanup plan. It, it never happened. And then in 2017, after several years of very little happening, the Water Board sent letters to the county and to the Army Corps saying, uh, we're going to issue an order to get this cleaned up. Now, the order was never issued, and the Water Board told Carol that there's a voluntary agreement between at least the Water Board and the Army Corps on the cleanup, but we haven't seen it. It's not posted on the web on GeoTracker, the, the link that Ann gave you. So one of the first things we need is to see that voluntary agreement, which will tell us what the timetable is for addressing this site, what the remedial action objectives are, the how much cleanup is supposed to happen, and what the mechanisms will be for involving the public in commenting on the plans for cleaning it up. Uh, they are doing stuff now. The county has proposed a cleanup plan for the lead, and we have a, mo you have a month to comment on that. And the Army Corps has been doing quarterly monitoring, and they say they're going to come up with a plan for cleanup, but we don't really know for sure when that will be. So, uh, again, if this work, what's going on now, it happened in 2009, we'd be in great shape, as far as I'm concerned. But because of the delay, it's really important that the community and their elected representatives put pressure on the Water Board and the Army Corps to, to get the TCE cleaned up. May have the next slide. So I'm going to be talking a lot of technical stuff and maps that you probably won't be able to read will be on the screen. But these are the, thing, the takeaways that I'm hoping when you leave here, you walk away with. The first thing is really important. You folks living in Sun City are not at current risk of exposure to the TCE from the site. So, so you know, you can, you can breathe the air in your homes. <laughs> but secondly, unless the TCE that's in the groundwater and the soil gas is cleaned up, it will continue to slowly move toward Sun City because the groundwater flow is from the Titan site across Oak Tree Lane into Sun City and as well as the, the undeveloped properties in between. The new homes proposed for Hidden Hills and Crocker Knoll will need, require sub-slab depressurization systems to protect against vapor intrusion. I'll explain that in a minute, but these are the kinds of systems that are very common in many parts of the country where radon is an issue. I don't know how much radon is an issue around here, but uh, in other parts of Cal in the Sierra foothills, it's an issue. And then, as I said, the county plans to clean uh, the lead from its property. Uh, we, don't know, we don't know so much. We don't know, oh, I see. We, we don't know as much about its plans to deal with any structural uh, structures that are underground at the site. Next slide. So environmental response, or what we, we colloquially talk about as cleanup, ex consists essentially of four stages. Investigation, in which sampling is done to determine where the contamination is, what the geology is like. Mitigation, which is if you have a building where people might be exposed, or drinking water where people might be exposed, you eliminate the pathway. So you haven't removed the contamination, but you're protecting people in the short run. Remediation is actually removing or breaking down the contamination. And long-term management is what you do when the other things don't totally remove the contamination. And this can be done in overlapping stages. So, for example, the pump and treat system where they remove the TCE, the 10 pounds of TCE in 2001 through 2004, um, that took place as a pilot program uh, while they were still had not completed the investigation at the site. But the, this, is, this is kind of the general progress, and if there's actually an agreement, a uh, voluntary cleanup agreement, these steps would be defined in that agreement between the Regional Water Board and the Army Corps of Engineers. Next slide, please. 
Vapor intrusion is a very apt term, and it's a, this is actually the environmental problem that I work on most. It's a big issue in my community. And basically, when a, a, a volatile organic compound or a solvent such as trichloroethylene is released into the subsurface or even on the surface of the land, it contaminates the soil. It contaminates the soil gas. It exists as a gas between the water table and the surface. And unless the water table is extremely low, it contaminates groundwater. The soil gas can move in any direction and contaminate, you know, a couple hundred feet in any direction. But when the groundwater is contaminated, the TCE flows with the groundwater and covers a much larger area. And then, and this, this graphic shows, that the TCE in the groundwater volatilizes or evaporates as a soil gas. I know soil doesn't look like it has gas in it, but it really does. Between the particles of soil, it's, there's a gas. And so the, anywhere the groundwater flows, it can volatilize and rise toward the surface. And as it rises toward the surface, it's actually pulled into buildings, particularly homes, that have a lower vapor pressure than the subsurface. So we generally don't worry about vapor intrusion on open land, parks. We worry about it in buildings, particularly houses. You know, a lot of commercial buildings are pressurized with their heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. Uh, homes tend to pull up the soil gas. So the risk, long-term risk to Sun City is if that plume of contamination in a significant amount moves under Sun City and the contamination volatilizes. It's not there now. It'll be years before it reaches, but something's got to be done. And then for the, the properties where development is proposed between the Titan site and Sun City, that those are areas where people have to be protected now because there's contamination on those properties now. So again, it's called vapor intrusion. It's vapors intruding into homes. And there's a lot of research being done on it. I go, I'm going to be at a, a workshop that EPA has in a couple weeks. I'm part of a research project they have. We don't understand everything about it, but we know a lot about it. And we know that if you don't remove the contamination, it's a continuing threat. Next slide, please. The contaminant of concern here is trichloroethylene. And it's called tri because it's got three carbons. And it's a colorless, non-flammable, volatile liquid. Uh, you won't smell it, but if, if you worked with it, you would smell it. And it, it's, when it gets in the groundwater, uh, it rarely, yeah, it, it evaporates slowly to make the soil gas but it stays there a long time. There are some situations where it will degrade. Uh, if, it, if it's mixed with, let's say, fuel, uh, it may, may degrade into other compounds. But again, this is as, well, they haven't used it at the site since the 60s, and it's still there. So you know it's gonna stay there a long time, and it takes a long time to clean up. And it's something that not only does it cause cancer, but short-term exposure to pregnant women uh, can cause cardiac birth defects, and it can cause Parkinsonism and other neurological diseases. The importance of the risk to pregnant women, and, I, and I, I appears there probably aren't that many in the room today, <laughs> <laughs> but if you have visitors, people who work for you, um, the EPA believes that the cardiac birth defects that might be caused by exposure could be through an exposure as short as one or two days in the first trimester of pregnancy. So while cancer, we're talking about exposures over a lifetime, 30 years, 70 years, whatever calculus you want to use, the risk to pregnant women means that you've got to make sure that the contamination levels in the building never go above the, the, the standard. Next slide. So I'm sure it's hard to figure this out. These are groundwater contour maps. 
sort of, not really circles, but concentric circular um, lines. And basically the smallest circle is the highest concentration of TCE. And as you go outward, uh, you get to the lowest concentration of TCE. And that's that, what that well, the unit is, is microgram parts per billion. And so the outer line is, is five. I think the highest amount on this map is 300. Uh, it's not the, the you know, in my community, they once had million parts per billion at one, one point. Um, so it's not, this isn't the most contaminated site. But the key thing is it's contamination where people are going to be living. Um, the contamination, the highest levels are centered in the sort of the upper left-hand corner of the Hidden Hills property. And, uh, you know, it's not in the middle of the uh, Titan site. And that appears to be because they dumped the, tight, the contamination on the land. The groundwater flowed downhill, and then it, as it flowed downhill, it sunk, sunk into the groundwater. So it's not that the contamination was released initially off the, the site. It was released on the site, and it flowed in that direction. The key part of this map, the, these two maps, is the one on the left was taken in the fourth quarter of 2019, and the one on the right was taken in the fourth quarter of 2021. And you can see that outer blue line on the left side of each map is moving towards Snapdragon Lane. So the, the end of the shaded area is the back of the houses on Snapdragon Lane. Now that is a low level. It is not a serious concern at this point but it indicates that the contamination is slowly moving in that direction. On the left-hand map, there's an arrow that shows the direction of groundwater flow. The contamination is moving with the groundwater. Now, a couple of caveats here about how accurate this data is. Um, the little, little rectangles on the map are where they had monitoring wells. And as you can see, there aren't really a lot of monitoring wells near that, that line on the left. So they're interpolating the data they have. They don't really know for sure. <clears throat> it would be great to have more monitoring wells along Sun City boundary uh, to know exactly where the contamination is. And the other thing is that I think Ann may have shown a, pic a, a map from, from, from an early, in between these two dates. They actually showed it further away. Um, the amount of contamination is dependent on, it changes over time and it's affected by rainfall, and uh, I'm waiting to see the, the latest levels because the more rainfall there is, the more likely it is to push the contamination downhill uh, along the lines of that arrow. So we don't know exactly for sure where this line is moving, but we know that the contamination is moving, and it's important to take action to do cleanup to stop that movement. Even if it doesn't totally eliminate the problem, it would keep it from moving. Uh, back in 2009, the, the remedial action plan approved by the Water Board, they were use, going to use permeable, permeable reactive <coughs> barriers. And this is, our trench is filled with iron. When they piloted that at Moffett Field, we call it the Iron Curtain. Uh, and uh, as contamination, as a TCE contaminated groundwater moves through the trench, it's actually broken down when it interacts with the iron. And it's a great way to contain the contamination. I suspect that it's not the best way to do cleanup now because as you can see, the contamination has already crossed Oak Tree Lane. So one of the goals of the cleanup will be, be to clean up the TCE and to keep it from moving. I want to see what the Water Board says in their voluntary cleanup agreement what the goal is, how, how low do the concentrations of TCE have to be to say you're done, and by when. Next slide, please. So this, I think Ann showed some of these. Um, this is just to orient uh, where we are on the map. The one on the left corresponds to the last two maps. Uh, you can see the Titan missile site in the middle. Catholic Church to the left. Below it is Hidden, are, are Hidden Hills and Crocker Knoll. And off on the left is Sun City. Um, back in the m 
about seven or eight years ago, when they were looking at the development of the Crocker Knoll property, uh, they were talking about what it would take to build homes safely. And I'll get to that in, in, in a minute, mitigation. But for Hidden Hills, they're a little further along, and their way of dealing with the highest levels of contamination is to put a park in the upper left-hand corner of the map because vapor intrusion only occurs when you've got a building to be intruded into. And then a recreation center where the allowable exposure levels of TCE um, are higher, uh, they would put that next, and that's because people aren't in a recreation center all the time. Uh, the standards for residential exposure are based on basically a lifetime of people being in a, in a, in a home 24-7. And then this yellow area is where they would actually be putting vapor barriers in to protect people against exposure to TCE. And I've got two problems with that. Uh, other slides will be more detailed, but, but one is that vapor, we don't know how long a vapor barrier is going to last. We need a radon type system, subslab depressurization, to protect people in those homes. And we also do not know the extent of contamination in that area. Next slide, please. So, and I know this is hard to see, but soil gas contamination is the best prediction of vapor intrusion. Uh, groundwater, if there's more groundwater contamination, there's probably more risk of vapor intrusion. But the stuff that comes up into buildings is from the soil gas. And the contour lines on the left-hand map uh, show that the soil gas, highest levels of soil gas are near the upper left-hand corner of the Hidden Hills property near Oak Tree Lane. But they show a little more. There's a little circle on the corner, just outside the corner of the Catholic Church property, has a very high level. And there's a circle down toward the bottom of the Crocker Knoll property that has a very high level. Even though I want to move forward with remediation here, getting this stuff cleaned up, more investigation needs to be done to determine how that contamination got there. Was it because soil, contaminated soil, was trucked across the street and dumped at those sites? Is it because the, sometimes the water level, the, the, the groundwater goes up higher close to the surface? and causes more releases. But because there are these hot spots, but not, like as you move towards Sun City, the levels are very low. Well, they found a couple hot spots. I want to know why those hot spots are there. Are there more hot spots that they haven't found? Or are those the only ones? If we know those are the only ones, we know how to clean them up. We know how to protect people to live above them. But we have to make sure we found all the hot spots. So the Army Corps has proposed to the Water Board, and they've probably done it by now, additional sampling locations additional for soil gas. So these would be on the lower right-hand corner of the Catholic Church property and on the, on the Hidden Hills property because they have not fully delineated the plume that has found the boundaries of the soil gas contamination and there's no way you can clean up something until you know where it is. So that's something that's happening now, and I'm hoping the results will lead to answers. Chances are they will lead to more questions. So while it's important to, get the, the, to, to do cleanup, it's also important to do adequate investigation to make sure you're cleaning up the areas that need to be cleaned up. Next slide, please. So I mentioned mitigation or subslide depressurization. The, the diagram on the left uh, shows a system for an existing house. What they do is they put a vertical pipe through the slab, th through the basement floor. They connect it to a pipe that goes up the side of the building, and it exhausts out into the air. Uh, they probably should show that exhaust pipe being a little higher away from the building. Uh, but basically, what this does is it lowers the vapor pressure under the building. Soil, you know, I talked about soil gas, soil vapors. You lower the pressure. 
So if there is a crack or a hole, like around a pipe or something, that any movement of vapor will be downward rather than upward. It may actually ventilate some of the contamination, but the key reason this form of mitigation is, is successful is because it reverses the flow that no longer do you have vapor intrusion, you have vapor, I guess, extrusion. Putting a plastic or rubber barrier helps. You would do that where you can, but it is not, the state does not recognize that as adequate for protecting against vapor intrusion. And, you know, we've, we've only been addressing vapor intrusion for about 20 years systematically, and we don't know how long these products will last. They're often torn on ins installation. So when you talk about the new housing on the right, a proposal just to put in plastic or rubber underneath it is ins insufficient. You need to put in the same sort of system that you would for an existing building to depressurize beneath the building. You may put in gravel, it says crushed stone here, to make it easier to, for the vapors to flow, but that's the way you make housing safe. You prevent people from being exposed. Uh, the shortcoming of, in either case, is someone's got to make sure the system continues to run. The fan doesn't break. It's not some buildings. People said, "Oh, I unplugged that. I didn't know what it was." Uh, so, so there's, there's a need to to manage a mitigation system in the long run as long as the contamination is there. The one variation for new buildings, and this is done in my community of Mountain View, is if, if property is an area where you aren't sure whether the contamination is an issue, it makes sense to put in what they call a passive mitigation or passive depressurization system without a fan, because the fan is what pulls the vapor, the, depressurizes the subsurface. And you rely on the wind to, to pull the vapors up. And the reason you, there are two reasons you do that. One is it's a lot cheaper to put in a system before you build the building than, than to go through the basement and it doesn't get in the way. And secondly, you can monitor, you can sample for contamination when the building is built and if there's no contamination, you don't have to have a fan, you don't have to use electricity to make the system work. So again, this is a proven technology for making buildings safe, it, and it is possible to safely build, but you want to make sure you've done as much cleanup as you can and, it, I, and it clearly identify the sources of contamination before you build. So again... So, so it, this has to do more with people who would move into the to the new properties, but if eventually the contamination, the groundwater flows into under your homes, then you'd have to be concerned to put in a building mitigation system. So if nobody does the cleanup over the next decade or two, then you will have to worry about this. No current concerns. So, so, so he, he, he said, you, you said there were no concerns for the people living in, the built, in, in these homes right now. Go ahead. No, sir, you said that there were no concerns. Okay, indeed. Okay. okay. Yeah, if, you, if, we'll, uh, if we hang on to the question for a moment, because I know there's a thousand of them out there, let us uh, finish what we're doing here, and then we'll open up for everybody, okay? Could I have the next slide, please? So I've been talking about cleaning up, remediation, and there are many methods that can be used to remove TCE from the subsurface, from either the soil gas or the groundwater, or to destroy it in place. What the Army Corps did in around 2001 was called pump and treat. You pump the groundwater out and you run it through a filter, and that removes the TCE, and then that, that water is either goes to a wastewater system or a creek, or back in the ground. Soil vapor extraction is a vacuum type system. You basically vacuum the soil vapors uh, in many locations and that removes this, you can use that to remove the soil gas, which again 
is found in the area between the water table and the surface. Excavation, it's, we call it dig and haul. I'm supposed to fix that A-N. Um, so basically when the soil is contaminated, and this is what they're essentially they're doing for the, for the lead, you dig it up, <clears throat> and if it's seriously contaminated, you have to send it to a, a special landfill. Two of the most popular methods of cleanup now are what they call in situ methods, where you inject something into the ground uh, and it actually causes the, the TCE or other chemicals to break down in place, in situ. And you can in, it, introduce things like, say, molasses to cause bacteria, bacteria to eat the TCE, or you can introduce permanganate. Uh, usually, the, the, this is, these are very effective if you can get the material to the place where the contamination is. And you know, think of it as something of the consistency of toothpaste, and you're trying to squeeze that into the ground. And again, those are very effective methods if you can get them to the place where the contamination is. And finally, I mentioned the permeable, permeable reactive barriers, and that was uh, what they proposed years ago. This is a map from the 2009 plan. And that would have been a very good method of keeping the contamination from, from moving to the west. Uh, now I think it's too late. Next, please. I mentioned contamination indoors, um, where you have existing buildings. And they did look at the, the county building, one of the county buildings. Uh, you can sample with what's called a, a, um, a a passive sampling device or a vacuum device where you basically collect the air and you send it to a lab for analysis. And it's basically not, it's not very intrusive. So if there's a building that is above the contaminated soil gas or groundwater, it's relatively easy, but it takes time to sample to find out whether it's contaminated. Next slide. So this is my information. Uh, I read, tried to simplify what's a very technical issues. Again, I'm not expecting people, the first time they see this, to understand everything there is to understand about this site or vapor intrusion. <clears throat> I'm from Silicon Valley, and we've have, when we have community meetings, a significant percentage of the people there are actually rocket scientists, and they don't understand it either. <laughs> but if you want to know more details about this, um, that my stakeholder's guide is, is a good place to start. Let's see, do I have another slide here? Or is that, maybe not. Um, so, again, the Water Board and the Army Corps are again dealing with this issue. But they will only get it done, one, if they let the community know exactly what they're doing, and Two, give the community an opportunity to give input about what they're doing. And three, commit to getting it done in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, that can happen. The fact that there's so many people here today encourages me. Carol's coverage in the, in the paper really helped. Uh, things, sometimes things don't get real until they're in, in the public media. So I'm very optimistic that this site will be addressed in a way that protects the the residents of the new homes and keeps the contamination from those of you who already live in the area. Uh, it's just a matter of paying attention. Unfortunately, you had someone who, to excuse the expression, dug up the contamination. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. A ton of a ton of information. A lot of what we're going to have to digest as time goes along. I also ask. Uh, Sean Scully, if he would say a couple words in terms of what the city, Sean, most of you know, is our city manager for the city of Lincoln. He's also the proud new father of a, of a baby boy. Uh, third, I believe, by now, isn't it, Sean? Yep. <laughs> you think it's tough now. Wait till you get to the teen years. <laughs> Sean? Thanks, Ray. Uh, so I'm, you'll have to forgive me if I fall asleep while I'm talking to you. It's not you, it's I've, I'm sleep deprived. And um, I had forgotten how much work it is uh, to watch my wife uh, do all the work. Uh, 
so um, there's just a few things I want to uh, point out uh, because I think it's really important. I've fielded a lot of phone calls uh, over the last couple months uh, about this issue and have looked into it a great deal myself. And um, one of the things that I think can become very sad is um, when lack of information leads people to feeling uh, concerned or scared about their health. And so um, I'm going to read to you verbatim um, a public notice fact sheet, which uh, I'm sure is going to be distributed if it hasn't already, from the water board that was issued yesterday uh, on this site. Um, and it's got a lot of good information, so I would encourage you to read it. But I'm just going to pick two components out that, that uh, piggyback on what Lenny just said. Uh, the first is, uh, before I do that, uh, just to make it really simple, um, we're really talking about three things. One is uh, soil contamination of TCE, one is water contamination of TCE, and, and the final one is lead, and I'll, I'll touch on all three. Um, as it relates to C TCE, uh, quote, according to the Central Valley Water Board's review of existing data, and this is underlined, current residents are not exposed to contaminated groundwater since the groundwater is not pumped to the surface and there are no drinking water wells in the immediate area. Uh, area. Um, we, we did a little work a um, uh, couple weeks ago. Our water department uh, did some uh, line of sight measuring. We're, it's a, at least a mile and a half from the nearest um, water well. Uh, that we have. And if you don't know, um, most of the potable water that you uh, use in your faucets uh, comes from Placer County Water Agency, which pulls their water from the Sierras, so it's a real long ways away. Um, that's about 75% of our water. 25% um, is, is water that we pump from the ground. Um, and that's really just sort of a redundancy if we were ever having a, a major issue. We do also test for constituents, not just TCE, but many many of them, um, and TCE has come up as non-detect in any of those uh, uh, tests. So just to make it really clear that that is not a concern we have currently. Uh, the second part is the soil gas. I'm going to read that uh, verbatim too. In addition, TCE and CIS-12-DCE, which is a, a, a a constituent that's part of TCA, TCE, in soil gas is not present under existing buildings and current residents are not at risk from breathing these vapors. So that's not me saying that. That is the California uh, Central Valley Water Board saying that. Um, it's super important that we're clear about that uh, because I know how it feels to be in a situation where you're not sure and maybe you're concerned that over time you could have some sort of health, health effect as a result of it. Um, the, um, the second issue, uh, so we talked about water, right? We talked about uh, vapor uh, intrusion. Um, one of the things that we started to think about a little bit internally as city staff when we found out about um, sort of the location and on the east side of Sun City where it looked like some of the plume was potentially moving towards was um, I went to the building department and we dug up uh, a couple of old building permits uh, when that subdivision, that portion of the subdivision was built. And um, it looks as though um, at that time some type of vapor barrier system was installed on homes on Snapdragon. Um, it may be more expansive than that. We haven't got uh, that deep into the research, but it does appear that in that area at that time, and this would have been 25-ish years ago, um, there was some uh, knowledge of what was going on, which sort of tracks with the time frame that Ann explained a little bit earlier. Um, it's unclear to us whether that was a standard building um, uh, you know, plan that Del Webb decided to include because they build it all over the place and, and I'm sure they do build in areas that radon is, is uh, present. But um, I looked at the map this morning of like radon levels and it didn't appear as, as though our county was in um, even a moderate um, concentration. So what it says to me is maybe this had to do with the TCE contamination and so someone thought about it at that time. So I just think that's important to know. As I get more info on that and how expansive it is, it could be that they're built under every single home in Sun City. I just don't know yet. Um, 
And then um, the, the third thing I want to mention is that um, the, uh, the lead contamination from the gun range, um, the city and county have been discussing that for a long time. And a, a number of months ago, um, the county was consulting with the city about what type of remediation we'd like to see on that property. Um, and there is essentially, you know, to put it in real simple terms, there's a lesser version where it's much cheaper. You basically just cap the ground uh, with uh, concrete or something so that um, everything is below that barrier. Uh, or there is a remediation to a commercial standard where they essentially uh, scrape the dirt um, a number of inches down and remove the dirt and pellets um, and take it to an EPA landfill. Um, the county had decided um, uh, to just recently to approve a remedial action plan that my understanding is it, it will be a commercial level cleanup, meaning they will dig the dirt out and remove it uh, completely from the site. So that's fantastic news. And um, one less contamination problem to be concerned about on the site. Um, finally, uh, what I wanted to uh, also mention, because I've heard a lot of this from the, the community, is, well, you know, why hasn't the city done more here? Um, and I think that the honest answer to that is that um, the city was not and is not responsible for the contamination of this site. And uh, it would be irresponsible of, of me as, as your city manager or, or really any uh, folks that represent you to spend your tax dollars locally on the cleanup of this site when it's uh, clearly a federal responsibility. And so that question gets asked a lot, so I just wanted to make it really clear that that's sort of our perspective. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not super interested in seeing this taken care of. Uh, we, we don't um, want to see anything happen uh, that could cause anybody any kind of health effects long term. So just so uh, those are sort of the three or four things I wanted to be really clear on, and, and um, that's all I had, and, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sean. Can I say something? I, I, now I can see myself on the monitor, and it looks like I'm sleepy, and my cat did wake me three times last night. I don't have a baby. <laughs> but it's actually there are bright lights here. So I, I'm, I'm wide awake. Don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lenny. Uh, I want to introduce one more person who's not up here. Um, the handsome gentleman over there holding up the wall is uh, Ken... Long. Ken is a local contractor and a resident of the city, and he's been working diligently with this committee, showing up every meeting and help us out a ton with, con with uh, our contacts and coordinating things. Thanks, Ken. Last but not least, <laughs> last but not least, uh, the, sitting down here all by herself uh, is Carol Feynman. She's the editor of the Lincoln News Messenger and a committee member. And it's all yours, Carol. Thank you. I just want to say that when we were putting together this meeting, this committee, I was really excited when the water board told me they, they would send a few staff members here to give an update. I was really excited about that. Then I was happy also to hear the Army Corps staff member tell me that she would be here. Well, they're not here. And I find that troubling that they don't want to come here to to talk to us and give us an update. Um, I mean, I want to hear, then I want to hear in real time what's happening, not when they decide to send out a press release. I mean, residents of Lincoln deserve that. Um, I was frustrated. I was equally concerned that they were withholding information that the public deserves to know. I'm also been frustrated that I've sent numerous emails and phone calls to the Army Corps staff. The last few weeks, I wanted to do a positive story on the Restoration Advisory Board that many of us got invitations to be on. They stopped answering my phone calls. They stopped answering my emails. This was something positive about how can we help you guys solve this, re um, the TCE. I thought it was a great step that they were doing this RAB board, but they didn't want to talk to us. I just find that's really troubling. And I also don't understand why we invited County Supervisor Shanti Landon. She was going to come. She was going to bring some county people with her. She seemed excited. 
Then on Monday, I got an email that said, quote, I just wanted to let you know, we heard that the Army Corps will not be present at Wednesday's outreach meeting in Lincoln Hills regarding the missile site, but that they will be putting out a press release announcing a series of community meetings on the topic. With that, I don't plan on attending on Wednesday, but we'll stay apprised of the dates the Army Corps puts out and make sure we attend at least one of those meetings with county staff and myself, end of quote. I thought today would be a great time for her to meet her, her, the people that live in her area and you know, just meet with us. With that said, I'm really encouraged to see the city of Lincoln represented, represented with city manager Sean Scully, with city councilman Bill Larson, with Paul Joyner here, and Holly Andreata here. I'm excited that U.S. Representative Kevin Kiley's representative is here that um, I think U.S. Senator Padilla's and Dianne Feinstein's office staff are watching us, that State Assembly Joe Patterson has his, has his staff member here, and Senator Niello's office is watching. I mean, I, I thank them for being here or for listening. It's up to each one of us in this room and on Zoom, since we don't have the county helping us, and we don't have the Army Corps answering our questions, and we don't have the water board answering our questions. It's up to us to put pressure, like everybody's saying, on our congressmen to get something done. There's money in the federal government to do that. It's not gonna cost the county a dime. So all of us must stay on the county to clean up the lead and the other contaminants at and around the missile site. I also wanna thank Lenny Siegel for coming here. This is the second time in two months that he has come to help us get a positive outcome. We can do it. I mean, we can clean the site up if we all take an interest in it. Well, we're all here doing an interest, but we all need to keep pushing because some of our elected officials are not listening to us. And I also want to thank the committee that is started with Ann, um, Bill Larson, Ken Long over there, who's supposed to be up here, but, um, and Ray, who joined us. I want to thank them for just, you know, giving up their weekends to work on this each, each week. Um, my newspaper is going to stay on this story, and we'll provide updates on the missile site remediation no matter how long it takes for the Army Corps and the Water Board and the county to give us solutions. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, we're going to, uh, this is a little bit like herding cats here. We're going to uh, open for questions now. We have microphones up in the front. If you, oh, he's gonna, we got a, we got a gentleman who's gonna walk around. So if you raise your hand, we'll try and get as many questions as we can. Hello. Hi, I'm Michelle Kubo. Uh, I live here in Sun City. I became aware of this a few weeks ago, largely because of the newspaper um, reporting on it. And I recently put a post out to the next door um, site regarding the meeting and the advisory board. So I have forms here if people want to fill out and and submit that to request to be on the advisory board. My opinion is that we are gonna get a lot more answers as an advisory board than we would as a public that they're going to notify when they're in the mood. So I would advise anybody that's interested to, to request to be part of it. They've, the, the forum asks questions like, are you affiliated with things? It, it gives the impression that they may or may not allow you to be on the advisory board, but um, they want 30 to 40 people. So, so if someone has a conflict of interest, like they, if they're associated with a, a, an army contractor, mm. they probably can't be on the okay. board. But actually, anybody can attend these meetings. So you, they're board members, and what I call the potted palms, people sit around the outside and, and listen and sometimes can ask questions. Uh, you know, they I, can attend the meetings, but yeah. the notification of the meetings they they can be they is, can be on the list. Okay, so maybe I mean, that'd be good. I mean, I, I, the, the military set up over 300 of these at one time, 
and I was one of the people who helped get them started. And they just provide a great opportunity for people to have continuing contact with the agencies and not just go to meetings and throw tomatoes, but actually interact and, and come up with constructive solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I have a couple of comments. One regarding the city of Lincoln, I, I understand that you are not responsible for this mess, but I was surprised that building permits were allowed even though you knew that this was an issue. So that kind of is surprising to me. Well, so just to correct that, um, no building permits have been issued at this point. Well, so, in some sure. city they were, and we were, in 1991, it was discovered that it was a groundwater mm -hmm. problem, and there have been homes built here since 1991. Right, but if you look at the map, um, the areas that are of concern are on the fur furthest e eastern edges, and so it, it could be, you know, I, look, I wasn't, uh, I don't know if you could tell how old I am, but I, I was probably like, you know, <laughs> Not you're drinking beers in college when this was all going on. Um, but um, uh, it, it would be surprising to me um, throughout the environmental process that if there was, if there was actual concern for health and human safety in that area, then you know, through the process of development, it would have been weeded out. Um, they, th what it says to me that there, that it looks like there are vapor barriers on that side of Sun City. It says that they were aware of it and tried to mitigate as best they could at that time. Okay, um, and then it seemed that Plume seems to be traveling, I think, fairly quickly. I think you said that the two direct, the two diagrams were from 2019 and 2021. So in a two-year span of time, it went from not being near Sun City to our backyards. And so if any mitigation is done, for example, um, the venting, are we talking about only Snapdragon or everything that's in the path of where that plume is going? So, so while the groundwater at five parts per billion is approaching the back of Snapdragon properties, the soil gas samples are along that area are far below the, the level of concern for predicting vapor intrusion. That's why I think you've got time. But, but again, you have to pay attention to that time. You know, the, the reports say the contamination is moving 11 feet per year. When I look at that map, it might be 50 or 80 feet per year. But again, the, the levels of contamination that are approaching the property because the soil gas levels are low, as far as we know, um, are, are not of immediate concern. Okay. And one last question. Has anybody submitted a FOIA request for the uh, Army Corps or the Water Board's documents on this, their, their agreement? Uh, I haven't. I don't know if Ann has. I, the city has not issued one. Typically, when we want information, they'll give it to us. Um, absent of a FOIA request, but uh, the website that um, I think Anne had on her, her site um, has everything going back dec many, many, many decades. It would take you a really long time to read, a read through it all. Except the agreement. Except, Except the agreement. Except the voluntary cleanup agreement. And what's going to happen that. moving yes. forward. The past is the right. past. We need to know what okay. the plan is okay. moving that forward. This gives, uh, thank you very much for that. This gives somebody else a chance. We got a lot of hands up that we can. Yeah, my name is Chuck Barnhart and I live a couple doors off of Snapdragon. I worked at McClellan for uh, 22 years. That McClellan pop, uh, polluted the west side of the base. They got funds through the DOD and the government and the super PAC. All the military bases got that money. This is attached to Beal. That money should be coming out of Beal to, re, to re clean up this place. They also set up a pumping system with a filter system out there that continuously cleans that groundwater up. We've been waiting 60 years to get this place cleaned up. It's time to quit talking about it, get people together, set them down, and come up with a resolution and get it going now. Yeah. Yeah. This. This waiting around for the water board or for the Army Corps engineers to come back, get them in a room, set them down, and get it done. 
now, not next year, not next month, now. I, I, I share your concern. Uh, McClellan Air Force Base is one of the most contaminated military sites in the country. And a lot of money has been spent there, hundreds of millions of dollars. This doesn't take nearly as much. But just one thing, the formerly used defense site program, which this is a part of, does not run through Beale. It runs through the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, that's one of the reasons this site didn't get money as quickly, because the formerly used defense site program didn't have an sufficient funding for a long time. Um, I just let me, let me uh, say something. I think the, if you all have been receiving my emails, the biggest, strongest group of people are those who say something. And if you can write your local, county, state, federal, elected officials voicing your concerns and that you've attended this, that you know, you've got the Restoration Advisory Board, let them know what you want. Without your voice to say this, without 450 voices and however many are on Zoom to let our elected officials, except for those that are here and that are listening on Zoom, nobody's going to know. So write those letters, email them. We will be putting the email addresses for every, especially Sean's, okay, <laughs> <laughs> on as many sites as we can. Thank so, you. Uh, anyway. We'll take one more question on the floor, then we're going to have to go to Zoom. Who's up next? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Kulvinder Singh. I'm a lawyer and a broker. I live in Roseville. I don't live here, but I have lots of friends here. Hi there, Carol. What I wanted to ask Sean, you know, Rancho Cordova has had a very similar problem because it has lots of stuff under the soil. In fact, they have requirements that they get water from the other side because they can't drink the surface water. They have all these restrictions as close as in Rancho Cordova. What I wanted to ask you was if you knew anything about Rancho Cordova and how they handled things because it cost, I'm sure, a lot of money now to build this pipe and pump to get the water from the other side. And as to my friends back here who were suggesting writing people, I think you need an attorney and I think somebody needs to have some depositions taken Maybe then you might get some action in your lifetime. Um, so uh, I thank you. I don't know about Rancho Cor Cordova's unique issues, uh, but I can tell you that um, my last city manager uh, position, I one of the community I worked in had a, a uh, decommissioned army ammunition base, um, which was significantly contaminated, oh, yeah, um, and so. I'm super familiar with mitigation measures to make sure that uh, you know things are safe. As I said earlier, though, water in in this context, as it relates to CC, is not something that we're concerned about from a drinking perspective uh, at all. Okay. So Rancho Cordova is the home to what we used to call Aerojet, and they manufactured rocket fuel, and they released not only TCE but perchlorate, NDMA, all kinds of things into the environment. There's a long-standing cleanup program. The issue there is they were able to get the federal government to reimburse them because they were a federal contractor. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, I have a point of uh, order here. Everybody that came here came here because they want to find things out. What we know is we don't know a lot about a lot of things. That's the facts. Secondly, I want to point out we are working on the Aerojet, um, John Fowler and myself. And that plume has been moving all the way from Rancho all the way over to Fair Oaks, and it's still moving. Now, with all this rain we're having, that's going to accelerate the potential of moving this thing even further. This is a time bomb, a ticking time bomb. And what we're talking about here is we don't know what the ultimate impacts of that are going to be. These people here and myself will probably be dead. Excuse me, pass on. What I'm saying to you is this. The Water Quality Control Board should have issued a cleanup and abatement order and not a voluntary agreement. A voluntary agreement based upon my 50 years of experience, I've been around on toxics, I was the one that was part of the poisoning of America, started in Disneyland back in the 1980s. Getting back to where we are now. We are the taxpayers. We are the public. We are the people. The Corps of Engineers, from my experience, 
they're sort of like out to lunch, you know, nothing personal. That's my experience, okay? So going back to where I'm at, we need to have that plan they're talking about, and if we are not satisfied with that plan, then we go to the regional board and tell them to issue a cleanup and debate in order and get this thing in order. Thank you so much. I, wow. I would like to speak Thanks. next. Just a moment. We've, we've had two gentlemen standing back here since the beginning. Gentleman in the blue. Uh, thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me now? Okay. There we go. I see a lot of uh, concern um, in uh, your minds here uh, about the health of uh, particularly northern Sun City residents. But let me let me give you a different warning, if I may. If no action is taken, and the first time it's published in the newspaper or with radio or wherever that a resident of Sun City Lincoln Hills has been affected by this problem, then all over Sun City, way down to the south, everybody's real estate price is going to drop. You are going to lose money if this is not done. Thank you. Thank you. I'd Gentlemen, like to speak next. Glad shirt, then we're going to go to Zoom. I'd like to, to speak next, please. I'd like to speak next. Excuse me. All right. Let's go. Let's take a question from Zoom, if we could. Okay. First of all, um, I want to thank incredible work that all of you on the board are doing up there. Uh, that was a great, great uh, honor to have everybody here. And then especially all the residents that are here. Uh, bless you for coming, but also all the wonderful, great ideas that uh, are being presented. I, uh, I'm from back east, from Massachusetts, New Bedford, as a matter of fact. Site of multiple super funds. And I remember the remediation we had to do back in the late 60s and 70s for extreme contamination. I think that if we move as a group, all the suggestions that were made earlier to write and to move actively, that we will get a lot of things done uh, much more effectively and much more quickly. And again, I want to just thank you all for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a hand up. Who was next? This gentleman right here with him. Yes, thank you. Um, as an engineering physicist, I'm going to ask some technical questions. Is there anybody on your board or in your group or associated with you who is an expert in computational fluid dynamics, particularly as it pertains to groundwater flow? My guess is no. And that's the reason why you show beautiful pictures of plumes that are smooth and so forth, and then, oh my God, there's some hot spots. I wonder why. It's because it's not simple Darcy flow or flow in a porous, porous medium because there are clays in the soil, and this is a very, very complex so, uh, problem, and it requires not just a few monitoring sites. You've got to have people modeling it as well. So some of the documents do have a, a detailed model, uh, but with all the cobbles that you've got underground here, it's really hard to predict groundwater flows. And also you may have what are called paleo channels, where there used to be a stream bed tens of thousands of years ago. Those can act as preferential pathways, and the contamination may move very slowly one place, and it finds that preferential pathway and it moves a lot faster. And that's, that's a good argument, as you said, for doing more sample, better sampling. Better sampling and better modeling. Thank you. Question Thank back you. here. What, what, one of the items that I have not heard mentioned is an estimate of cost. If you took the dig it out approach, just dig it out and haul it away, what is the estimate for how much that might cost? Just give me a back of the napkin, finger in the wind, give me a ballpark estimate. How much do you think you're talking about? A million dollars? Five million dollars? What's so the number? For the TCE, um, you'd have to do more than dig it out because it's in the groundwater. Uh, but for, I, I, I haven't read the remedial action plan for the lead, but they may very well have 
uh, they probably do have a cost estimate for that there. Uh, typically, when you have a proposed uh, remedy, they do what's called a feasibility study. Feasibility study lists several options and gives you cost, timing, and using several criteria, the agencies choose what is the best remedy, and that's the time at which the community has to be involved. Uh, at Moffett Field, where, where I'm from, you know, we basically said, yeah, we're willing to, to, to not have the most expensive remedy, but we also don't want the cheapest remedy. I, I'm and still so, not hearing a number. Can we so get a, can I, we get a I, number I, out here we, on the wall? We don't have a number for the TCE. There may be a number in the remedial action plan for the lead. What do you think is the cost of five cases of cancer, reduction by 30% of the home values in Sun City, and all of the bureaucratic time that has gone into this so far and as I can see is going to go into this for years to come. I would propose that the cost of just doing it is probably 10% of what's already been spent and what will be spent on useless talk and no action. Yes. <laughs> all right, you, um, you're, you're probably right. We're running uh, out of time here shortly. Okay. Do we take let, me, I, no. let me just say one thing about the lead. I believe it was in 2009 they said it would probably take, uh, I believe it was two and a half million dollars to clean it up, the lead, down to a foot. That would be removing 12,000 cubic yards of soil and 150 cubic yards of lead. One cubic yard of lead weighs about 19,000 pounds at room temperature. But that's a lot of lead, and since it might have been 2015, I'm not real good on dates like that. I'm still 60 years old. <laughs> but um, it, go to, go to geotracker.waterboards.ca.gov. You can look at these documents. They, they have a lot of studies they've done on, on the TCE and the lead. Uh, remediation. It's going to be a lot of money no matter what it is. They're not going to take out 20 feet of dirt to, oh. to take out the TCE. Yep. Let me just, I just want to okay, add one, right. one quick let's, thing. Uh, to, let's take one more question from Zoom if we can, then we'll take some Ray, more. Ray, before I, we move I, on, I had the mic can, next can I just ahead. add one quick thing to the gentleman's comment back there? This is why the conversation is important. I understand that it would be great to simply march into the Department of the Army's office and demand that they write a check to, re to remediate the property. But one of the things that Lenny explained um, on site uh, the other day was that we have to remember there are thousands of contaminated sites across the country. And uh, while funding does exist to remediate them, it is much more like a granting process than it is an entitlement process. And by that I mean you have to advocate for your cleanup. Because guess what? There's plenty of other properties and sites throughout the country that, that are, are contaminated and they want those cleaned too. Okay. Hi, my name is Barbara. Um, first, I want to thank Carol Farneman and the, and the uh, Lincoln Messenger and Ann for lifting the shades off of all of this. It's an unacceptable situation. I am so delusioned and disgusted with our government officials. This threat to health and values, our investments in homes, has been going on since 1991, and as usual, it has been swept under the rug by our local and federal government. What a shock it must have been with the Lincoln Messenger that you all had the covers ripped off of you. The Corps of Army Engineers, Placer County, Placer County Supervisors, and the Lincoln City Council have all thrown this hot potato back and forth with nothing left but excuses. Now we get letters about joining this uh, advisory board. Uh, don't you think that we should know by now? Let's see, 1991 to 2023 equals 32 years. Let that sink in, 32 years. This so-called panel, just another, not you, but the uh, advisory board, uh, is, is just a ploy to just drag that can right down the street again. And uh, we are told by you, Sean, 
that it, you know, it's not the responsibility of Lincoln, uh, and that it's the core of uh, Army engineers. I say, uh, the last time I looked, this is a representative government, and you are our voices. Where have you been? Thank you. Thank you very much. En env environmental cleanup. Okay. All right, we, we have, governed we have time for two more questions, okay, and then can, we're can, can, can everybody is starting to get restless here. So we have a lady in the back. Thank, thank you. Um, my question is probably naive, so bear with me. We moved here in 2014. I don't recall if there was a disclosure of this issue. If there was, then shame on me. There was. Okay. So now the disclosure, given that it's traveled, is that even more dire? And how much space do you get or distance before that's put in a disclosure when you're purchasing? You know, I might need to get your information. I, I can't speak to real estate disclosures. I, I need to ask an expert on that. I'm sure there's a realtor in the room. Maybe they can answer Okay. okay. I'm, uh, I'm in okay. the back. Thank you. So, so, environmental cleanup in this country is governed by state and federal laws, and there are processes that the agencies have to follow. Um, and when you go to their meetings, they'll spend half the meeting explaining those processes. And the thing that the community needs to do, and as my community did, and communities I've worked with all over the country, is understand the points in that process where you can influence the outcome. Unfortunately, it's all going to be slower than we want. I, it, uh, that's just the way it is because there are laws that have to be followed by, the, by these agencies. But as far as property values go, and I've seen this in my community and many other communities, when this first hits the newspapers, everybody's worried, scurrying around, oh my gosh, the sky's falling. Once there's a process in place, to address the cleanup. Not that it's all removed, but there's a process in place and the people in charge take charge, then your property values go right back up. So again, you have reason to be worried, but the fact that you're here today and people are starting to do things means you won't have to be that worried for that long. Thank you for that, Lenny. I'm in, I'm uh, in the back and I have a couple of questions. Uh, first question is, um, I would like to have a form letter that I can send to the 25 emails you're going to send me so that we're not all composing our own words of the, about this? If that could be done, I'd like that to be maybe published locally. Uh, could be in the compass or something that's easy to access. That's the first thing. Second thing is how often are you going to report to us and how? It would be nice to simplify that so we don't have to do internet searches every day. And the third thing is if it's all about this squeaky wheel gets the oil, then while I admire the Lincoln Messenger work that's been done, in fact I think the work that's been done by all of you is fantastic. How do we elevate this to make it an area crisis point where should Lincoln Messenger include the SAC B? Should we be talking to TV stations? Um, when we write our letters, it's good to have a lot of momentum build. And I would like the opinion of the people on the panel. How do we raise the temperature here? When I first heard about this uh, from Sean, I was more concerned about the actual site. Uh, it was flooded, covered by lead, and then I found out about the TCEs. Uh, apparently, this has been go we've known about this for about 31 years, um, and we really have to keep the pressure up on our elected officials, myself included, but uh, uh, the city uh, is not really responsible for cleaning this up. 
Uh, it's the federal government, uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, the Water Board. So we have to keep the pressure up on our local officials, our city, our uh, state, and federal officials to make sure this thing is cleaned up. Um, again, it's, we've known about this for 31 years, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about time we do clean it up. Um, we, are, uh, we are running way more than we thought we were gonna be here. Um, we have one hand waving back there. He either needs recitation or wants to have a question. Yes, hello, thank you for the uh, information that you've disseminated to us here today. I'm um, curious as to, are there any current downstream wells or are there future downstream wells to monitor continued migration into the Auburn Ravine? You mean monitoring wells? Yes. Uh, that's a water board question, which is why we had hoped they would be here today. Uh, my understanding is they're going to continue to monitor and expand monitoring where needed. I did ask that question about the ravine because I was concerned about that too. And uh, on the water contamination side, they had no concerns that, that any contaminated uh, material would end up in the ravine component. I guess it's different levels of, of water table. Right. And I had a question for Lenny, probably. My recollection is that TCE is heavier than air. Is that true? Uh, it's heavier than water, but as a vapor, it's, I, w I wouldn't say it's heavier than air. Okay, I thought it, I it, it, it spreads out through the atmosphere and actually degrades in right. the atmosphere. Right. But it's, it's not like methanol or ethanol that, that just rises and permeates every space, right? It, it tends to break down in, in, in the atmosphere. Okay, um, we really. Uh, I, I have another question. We, uh, we have uh, to take. We have, we have to take one question from Zoom. Everybody, okay. we promised them. It, so, can we do that. What can we do to try and force the water board and the army to at least be present? I mean, I'm assuming you're going to have other forums like this in the future, and we would like them to participate because everybody here has been saying, complaining and faulting and blaming, and really the two people to blame for this delay didn't show. Well, okay, three. But the two that can do anything about it, the water board and the army, didn't bother to show. What, what can we do? So when, when Ray started, he said this wasn't political. He, he was sort of wrong. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not political party, political but it's political in the sense that when, when you want to get a stop sign at your corner, when uh, you want a new park, what are the things that you do to influence the government? What are the things you do to, to, to get more media than the, the local paper? Those are the things you need to do to get this site cleaned up, to get the, these agencies present. And you have to hold their feet to the fire because they've got a lot of other irons in the fire. And supposedly they're watching us on Zoom, so maybe they're listening to you, all of us. Who knows? The, uh, this is not the end, gang. Um, this is the beginning. This okay. committee got together, thanks to Ann and Carol. We started this forward. We're not going to back off. What we need from you, more than anything else, is those letters, emails, any way you can to contact the elected officials and let them know that we're serious about this. We are not going away and we're gonna get it taken care of. I think we've, uh, if those of you that have a few questions left, if you would save them and maybe come up to the panel, whatever, I think we need to kind of wrap this up for a lot of people are getting very okay. uncomfortable my, my in here. My question is, thank so, you for this forum, but for this forum, what is the, the very next step? Is it, uh, you're gonna give us a form letter, you're going to give us addresses, um, other than this advisory board, is it beneficial to have any other sort of group comprised out of this attendance today to be formed to assist you? When are we gonna meet again? I want some concrete next steps that we're going to get before I leave today. <laughs> I do want to say one thing about the site. The Titan site is owned by Placer County. It's private property. It's fenced off. 
I know, I'm just reaffirming it. Don't go on it. Um, they don't want us on there. Carol and I have been banned. <laughs> so you can go up and see it. You can see where the fire station was. You can actually see the silo covers from Oak Tree Lane. You can see almost everything. Go to, go to the drone videos on YouTube. You can see everything. So, so one easy thing people can do is if those of you who've written letters, emails or whatever, share them on your social media, whether it be Facebook or Nextdoor, so other people can use, form letters usually aren't, when I was on city council, when I saw a form a letter beginning the same way the last one did, I skipped it. But if you, if you share letters on social media, so each of you can adapt them and know where to send them, then they'll get a lot of effective letters. So what's take the next step we're going to get from you? To, what's the next step we're going to get from you today? When will we be, be able to come back here and get follow-up information or anything else that we can help you do? But I want a next step in my mind when I leave here today. And not just tell me to write letters. I need a form letter. I need an email. Yeah, no, I, I hear, I hear your, your question. Uh, I, I'm going to leave it, you know, to Anne since she's sort of the leader of this sort of informal and becoming more formal group but my suggestion would be to find a date that does work for the Army Corps and Water Board I spoke with the Water Board a few weeks ago and they uh, regardless of the fact that they're not here today they were very clear that they have public outreach teams that do this for a living and would be very willing to meet and well, I am doing that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, let me let me but make you know, a comment. They don't, okay, let ahead. me make a comment on that for for Sean. Sean has been busting his tail, contacting people, trying to make this thing work. We, this group that's up here right now, we're here for a reason because we agree with you. There is a problem, and we need to do something about it. But a lot of people sit on their hands and doing stuff. But it's not this group. Sean, the city, Bill has been busting his tail. Um, so we are going ahead. There are meetings. We are strategizing as we speak on how to get these key players together. It's like herding chickens and trying to get them all into one room. Um, but we're going to do that. Uh, this is, we're not backing off. This is not a one-time thing. This is a process. And the process requires you to have trust in us and us to be transparent enough with you to have that trust. But we need to get the people together. We are going to be publishing. I don't know where and how all of them. There are several things we're already talking about. For you will know what's going on. For you knew who to contact, where to write your letters, and who to call. So we are going to do that. I think we need to call this part to a halt. Uh, I would like to thank everybody up here for all the work they've done. And I'd like to thank you for showing up. This is exactly what we were hoping for. This is exactly what's going to make a difference. And I guarantee you, some of the folks who won't hear today are going to hear about it and wish the hell they would have been. So thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Be careful. <laughs>